welcome back to my channel my name is Jojo and today I'm going to be bringing you a video all about district 75 I know that the New York City teaching fellows have already rolled out their acceptance letters many people are starting um, the cohort now in January and February and also um, for the summer cohort, they start rolling out their, their acceptance letters in April, mid-April to start in June and July. And many, many fellows have opted into working into District 75. I'm just gonna go right into it. I got some questions. Um, I, I do know some people that are thinking about joining the fellows, the fellowship program and some who are already in the fellowship program and have DMs me, send me um, some emails with some questions, and I narrowed down the questions just to make, you know, a brief video because these this video specifically on District 75, it contains so many different layers and so many different elements, like this can be an hour long video, but I've chosen just to break it up. And today I'll just be answering, you know, question, general questions on what District 75 is. So I'm going to just look at my computer, see the questions that you guys have sent me and I'll answer them and we'll just go from there. Okay, so the first question that I received was, what is District 75? So District 75 is a specialized school district that serves students with severe neurological, cognitive, and physical disabilities. Um, so, you know, New York City, most of New York City students are educated in a regular community public school setting. Students in District 75 need um, more individualized educational focus. So they are served in schools that are still in the community but are under the District 75 realm. So the next question is, what does a typical classroom look like in a District 75 school? So there are a variety of different uh, classroom settings in District 75. So I'm just gonna go down through the list starting with the most restrictive meaning that the students need the most support in those class and then it moves up so first you have a six one-to-one -one, meaning there are six students one teacher one paraprofessional and when i say paraprofessional um it all depends on the students needs because many students that are in district 75 require additional support so they will have on their IEPs, a one-to-one -one paraprofessional, meaning that the para, if they are in a six-to-one-to-one -one class and they have an individual para, there will be an extra paraprofessional in that classroom who will be working with that specific student. And students can have a one-to-one -one paraprofessional for a variety of reasons like health and um, crisis management. So it all depends if students have a paraprofessional in their classroom, that'll change the number of individuals within that classroom. So we'll start off with a six one-to-one, -one, six students, one teacher, one paraprofessional. Then we have an eight one-to-one, -one, eight students, one teacher, one paraprofessional. And then we have 12 one-to-one. -one. Again, same concept, 12 students, one teacher. But then we have a 1214, which is students that have um, mobility issues. So you'll find students that are um, in, in, in wheelchairs, are unable um, you know, to mobilize. So you'll find there are 12 students there, one teacher and usually there'll be four paraprofessionals in within that classroom this question what are the differences between teaching in district 75 and teaching in a general education setting there are many differences um the first one of course would be the students 
um, District 75 students, again, um, they need a lot of individualized support. Um, different, they have different management needs uh, that, that they require to learn. They receive many services such as like physical education, um, adapted physical education, I'm sorry. They receive physical therapy, they receive occupational therapy, they receive speech therapy. Students in a general education setting, um, many of them do not receive those services because they are not needed. Um, many students in the general education setting, although who are in special education that may have like a learning disability, um, but can still be educated with their typically developing peers, do receive those services, but their mandates for the services, you know, are small compared to students in District 75. And again, um, a typical first grade classroom in a public school, you would have anywhere from 25 to 30 students in your class, one teacher. You don't have an assistant um, to help you with the students. We do have a tad bit more paperwork just because all of our students have IEPs, individualized education plans, and we have to write them. So if you have 12 students in your class, you'll be writing 12 IEPs. If you have six students, you'll be writing six IEPs. If you were in a general education classroom, you may have one student that's in special education. You only have to write an IEP for him. Um, overall, I think teaching whether you're teaching general ed or district 75 it's still teaching and you just have to really love what you do you know i, I don't really see like much of a difference i feel like if you teach general education you can teach district 75 it just has to be in you i mean you can if you could teach you can teach <laughs> So the next question I have is, do District 75 teachers get paid more? No, District 75 teachers do not get paid more money than regular general ed teachers. We are all under the same contract. Um, and you know, for contract reasons, your salary goes up based on numbers of number of years that you have been working and educational so when you have your salary step your your salary schedule i'm sorry you can go up this way in salary and you can go up this way in salary so it all depends how many years you've been working within the uh doe and your educational level for you to go up in salary but we all are under the same salary and we all get paid the same what is my work day like so my work day i find that it goes by very very fast so i'm just gonna run through what my schedule is like monday through friday so um the kids come in they all get bused to school we are downstairs in the cafeteria having breakfast. I make sure that my students eat. I have an eight one to one class and my students were all turning fives. So some of them are five. Some of them have turned six already. So there I have I have the babies. Um, so, you know, I have to make sure that my my babies eat. So they come in, they eat breakfast. Um, School starts around 8 o'clock, so by the time we go upstairs, it might be like 8.25. Um, we unpack, um, then we start our yoga program. We do this fabulous yoga program. It's called Get Ready to Learn. It really helps the students, um, you know, get in tune with themselves and prepare, you know, for the day. Um, after Get Ready to Learn, I do a morning meeting, and then I go right into math. Um, so by the time math finishes, it's 930. The kids have science. Um, science then is another 50 minutes. After that, the kids have lunch. The lunch is pretty early, early in my school. Lunch begins around like 1045. 
so the kids have lunch then they have recess um we come back up i do writing i do um social studies in ela and then i give my students a break um they have like a little snack they could read a book um they play with some puzzles during the class and during class um then they have art and then it's time to go home and you know what my day goes by really really fast i find that there's not enough time during the day the question that i got was how do you differentiate um so how do i differentiate my lessons um with with my students um so you really have to know your students you have to know how your students learn and what are their motivators and you know what are their their triggers like where is that point that you know you you don't want to hit so your student doesn't you know say i don't i don't want this anymore and will tantrum and you know we'll just shut down um you really have to know your students but for me i find that um you know just with my class i have a variety of different levels like i have one student who is able to read on a level f books which is you know reaching kind of second grade level um in in a general ed setting you may say and then i have one student that is still learning you know his letters and his numbers so that's a big gap so i try to not try i do um like my lessons always aim for whatever you know the standard is that i'm teaching to and whatever the objective is all the students are being exposed to that and then when we split up into groups i just target those individual skills that are needed for you know the the other students so each student is working for an overall goal but yet still targeting their specific skill set so this next question again it really kind of um backpedals off of the last one how do you reach your students different levels so again you know when i create my lessons i'm teaching to one objective and i'm really helping the students exposing the students to the overall you know academic focus but then targeting their individual needs so for example um let me see one example i can give is so well i'll, I'll do math so i did a math lesson um where we are doing addition up to 20 so my objective was students will use manipulatives to solve addition problems up to 20. so as i told you before some of my students are still learning how to recognize and count one-to-one -one correspondence but then i have other students who are able to do these addition problems without assistance um so i teach the lesson as a whole to the group exposing them you know we do um the workshop model in in my classroom where that's when i'm teaching the lesson i first show the students an example of how i want them to solve the problem and then together we do another example and then they break off individually and do you know their work by themselves so i'm exposing them to the addition having them participate come up so the students that are still you know counting and recognizing numbers i'm calling on them when um to identify numbers within you know the the math the the problem and that's how i involve them either they're counting manipulatives the ones who are able to solve the problem i have them solve it the ones who are identifying you know numbers i ask them you know what number is this touch number three is this number four um touch number seven so that's how i include them um into the overall lesson although my students who are in the you know the group that's 
early learners, they are not able to solve the addition problems, they can still count and identify and recognize, you know, the numbers that are used to solve those problems. Um, so when we split up into groups, I, you know, work with one group, my paraprofessionals um, are assigned different groups and that is how we we do our lessons and then we come back as a whole and everyone you know has taken part in the learning experience so how do i know if my students are learning assessment so again depending are the on their target skills and their individualized goals that they need to reach i constantly assess them throughout the lesson i ask them questions i make sure that they are responding even if it's just with eye contact for the nonverbal learners um you have to know that they are you know engaged within the lesson um responding to your questions getting the correct answers that that is just constantly assessing them that's how you know if your students are learning just by asking different different questions and even for those students who are nonverbal and can't you think that they are not able to participate they are able to participate you show them symbols you show them numbers you ask them to identify you know the number five if they look at the number five they just identified the number five for you even an eye gaze or a touch touch the number five that is participation that is your student your student just identified the number that you requested so your student is learning your student is engaged in the lesson so there are many many ways to assess if your students are learning you will know if your students are learning and if they when they are engaged learning is happening so what is the easiest and hardest part about teaching so this is a very hard question um the easiest part about teaching within this district would be hmm Oh man, what about teaching? So the easiest part about teaching within District 75 is just get getting to know your students and caring for them. Caring for them and getting to know them. Um, it's the easiest part. You'll find that, you know, many of our students, they they have a lot of obstacles and a lot of struggles in, in their life. And just um, you, you, you just, you just love them. You, you fall in love with them because they, they are angels. They are like so innocent and, you know, they, you see them every day. You know, you see them Monday through Friday, you're with them six or seven hours a day and you, you, you are a part of them. You want them to learn, you want them, you know, to succeed and, and to be able, you know, to do things that many people probably said that they couldn't do. And, you know, that, that's where you come in. And I think, I believe that is like a very, very big part of them succeeding is you as a teacher and your dedication that you have for your students to grow to me i think this is the the toughest job that you'll ever love the toughest job you'll ever love um the hardest part for me oh the hardest part for me hmm i could find money i think Okay, so for the hardest part, I have three. Time management, money, and wait time. Wait time. So wait time, 
when I ask my students a question and there's, you know, dead silence in the classroom, I, I jump in and I, you know, give them the answer I want to ask them. You know, I, I just want to tell them this is it. You know, I don't give them a time to process what I've asked and how to respond. So, mind you, I'm in year five of teaching and I still struggle with that. And I catch myself when I ask my students a question, I literally have to count to 10 in my head so I can be quiet and let them process what I have asked. So that's a hard thing for me. Um, Money. I want to give my students everything that they need in the classroom, everything that they love, everything that they want. I want to get it. The school doesn't give you much. You only get $250 as a teacher to buy things. And you'll find that during the year, you want to get this for your lesson. You want to get that. So you you have to come out of pocket a little bit if you want. Um, But there's also things like donors choose and grants and like lots of things that you can apply for and you can get. I'm always doing donors choose and my class always gets, you know, a variety of projects funded like. I got a library funded. I got um, a printer from my room, a laminator from my room. I've gotten tablets for my students. So you can do projects for basically anything on Donors Truths and just, you know, throw out your projects out there and use social media and stuff and get supplies for your classroom. You can even get snacks. Like I've done loads of snacks for my students. Um, so that's one thing that you can do to, you know, kind of save some of your own money um another thing that i find difficult is time management like i said before i find that my day goes by super fast so i really don't have much time to do work that that requires me to get it done at school and i forgot to say that Three or four times during the day, we have to take students to the bathroom. Some of my students go to the bathroom once every hour. So the other times that we, you know, are in the classroom, we'll be taking class um, bathroom breaks during our lessons, during lunch. We are always constantly moving and doing something. So the day goes by very, very quickly. So I really think um, my first year as a District 75 teacher, um, you know, it was overwhelming for me. Uh, There were a lot of times that I cried. Um, And I'm not ashamed to like say that because it's hard, especially when you do not have any experience like your schooling, your master's degree, wherever you studied is not going to prepare you for District 75 and for the students that you are going to have in your classroom. Like it's all you. You have to find what works for you. You have to find, you know, mat, um, behavior management skills that work in your classroom. You have to find what works for you and your individual students because all students are not the same. So like one experience that I had, another teacher may not have had that experience. Um, So it all depends on you and your students you know how how you're gonna see it but i i say that you know just be optimistic and if you do want to be a teacher you do want to teach in district 75 you really have to have an open mind and you really really have to you know care for these students and want to see these students succeed like some of these students come in you know with many many obstacles and many times they have told the students parents you know your child will never talk or your child will never walk and then they come into our classrooms and they leave talking they leave walking they leave feeding themselves they leave um you know with a lot of independent skills that 
they said they wouldn't have. And that's what is the most important, you know, thing to take from working in District 75. I mean, I love working in District 75. It's my passion. Like when you become a teacher, you will know where you belong. Like you can do your training for the for the fellows. You're able to do your training in different settings and for student teachers, like you will know where you belong. Like I did, um, I worked in a high school before and I was like, nope, this is not for me. I did junior high, oh, nope, it's not for me, the same thing. But then when I came to the lower grades, District 75, I was like, this is where I belong. This is who I need to be. You know, I think really that being a teacher, you cannot force it. it. It has to be something that is in you. It doesn't, it comes naturally. You can't force it. Many people try to force it and they find mid-year that they are very overwhelmed and they quit, you know? And what does that do to our students? It leaves them. Like, you don't want to do that to them, you know? So you have to really make sure that, you know, this is where you want to be. And, like, this is your passion and you have to have a passion to want to see them succeed. When you see you know, that child's reading when they said that that child wasn't even going to be able to talk. And then now they're reading to you. They're solving problems. They have all the life skills. They and that is such a beautiful thing. Um, all right, guys. So thank you so much for watching. I hope um, that I answered, you know, some of those questions as best as I could. I tried not to ramble on for so long, um, but leave me comments. Let me know if you have any more questions that you want answered. I'm going to upload a couple of more videos um, on lesson planning and things of that sort. So don't forget, like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys soon. Toodles!